Thanks for coming back to our series on ABA and MTSSB. Today, I am so excited to be joined by Brandy and Alyssa, and we're going to be talking about boosting morale and supporting positive relationships with ABA. As a reminder, I'm Molly. I'm from the New Hampshire Department of Education, the Bureau of Student Wellness and Nutrition. And Brandy, could you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, Molly. I am Brandy Pappas. I am here with the New Hampshire Department of Education the Bureau of Special Education Support. I am the Educational Consultant and Nessus Project Coordinator. Thank you, Brandy. And Alyssa, if you could also introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Alyssa Johnson. I am the um, Director of Behavioral Health with Constellations Behavioral Services. I'm very excited to be here, Molly. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you both. I'm so excited to learn from you guys. Your knowledge and expertise in ABA just is so incredible. And we know times are tough right now. COVID-19 kind of took a toll on everybody. And we're just, I'm just wondering why. Why did relationships break down during COVID-19 and kind of at the, we're coming out of it slowly. How is that still impacting us? Unfortunately, it's not no longer just COVID-19. There's the anxiety of COVID, perhaps loss of loved ones due to COVID, um, high stress in all of our environments. And is there any other reason? I, I can't imagine, you know, if a child, sometimes people just say when I was a teacher, oh, the child just kind of exploded. Is there ever a reason, you know, that something like that could happen where it's appearingly, you know, for no reason whatsoever? Absolutely. Um, you need to have a positive relationship with everyone and relationships break down because we don't always see what goes on in a student's individual day-to-day -day processes. It may be strained prior to your interaction with them. Um, there is always an antecedent. Um, sometimes you don't always see it. Something is always impacting an individual's behavior. For example, a student you're sitting with seems calm, great mood, and then all of a sudden they become angry, aggressive, um, refusal. You see no reason as to why this is occurring. You were perfectly fine. There's no one around them. Come to find out, you know, later on in the day, you email um, mom, dad, parent, guardian, and find out that they had a really, really bad night's sleep, never ate breakfast, and didn't want to get on the bus. So there you go. It now has manifest manifested and is happening then. There was the antecedent and you had no idea. Yeah, I think that's so important to understand that in the moment it could feel like nothing, but we're all humans with internal emotions and take time to process different events. So the antecedent, like you said, could be something from last night. It could be, I imagine some... Uh, amount of re-triggering if there was a, a different kind of example. Right. Alyssa, do you have any insight into why relationships might be breaking down? I do. Yeah, Molly, I, I really love, Brandy, what you talked about with antecedents and then um, even distant antecedents, right? Which sometimes we call them setting events, but they're things that happen, you know, a lot further away from the behavior. So we don't realize what impact those things might have on the behavior. Um, but as you were talking, you made me really start to think about um, something that uh, Pat Fryman, who's a really well-known behavior analyst in our field, he talks, he talks about something called the circumstances view or the circumstantial view. And um, what he is talking about when, when he talks about the circumstantial view is the ability to really look at um, a situation or a person's behavior, but not from our own perspective and our own angle only, but also from the other potential angles and, and understanding those circumstances. So um, an example of this could be, you know, a person comes in late to work and the supervisor is extremely frustrated. They are angry. That person clearly didn't 
manage their time well in the morning and they don't care about their job and they don't care that they're putting their colleagues out. Um, and it's very disrespectful. Um, but maybe what they don't realize is that that person um, received a really bad phone call that morning and had to make some arrangements or deal with something that was going on in their life um, and therefore had to come in a little bit late. And so the, the supervisor, without understanding those circumstances, might have thoughts about that person and act in certain ways towards that person um, that maybe don't match what's really happening. We see this in families as well. As well, um, You know, a student comes home from school and they, you know, throw their backpack down and they storm to their bedroom and they slam the door and the parent is thinking, what on earth is going on with my child and why are they in such a bad mood? And that was very disrespectful. And so the parent's um, response towards their child is to tell them to come back out here and take care of your backpack and do not slam the door and stomp around here. That's disrespectful and you're going to do it better the next time. Um, what they don't see, to your point, Brandy, they don't see all those distant antecedents. They don't see that maybe their child had a really bad end of their day. Math was really hard. They weren't ready for a test. And maybe they asked to go to the bathroom and they were denied that request. And then they had to rush to the bus and they were bullied on the bus. And all of those things add up. So um, I love that what you're talking about with the distant antecedents or the antecedents to a behavior um, also make us think of a circumstantial view that we have to be really taking into consideration all of the angles of what someone might be experiencing, because that could potentially impact the way we think about them and our approach towards them, which really and truly could help support um, a more positive relationship or a more positive interaction. Yeah, yeah, that's, oh, go ahead, Brandon. Absolutely, no, absolutely, I loved all of that. Yeah, I, I mean, me without the ABA expertise, it reminds me of my mother always telling me, you know, Put, put yourself in somebody else's shoes. You take their perspective. You never know what's going on in their life. It's that same, but you guys have the real expertise kind of language around um, antecedents, which I love. Are there concrete steps for our viewers or uh, strategies they could take to kind of help improve and bolster the relationships that they have? Uh, yeah, that's actually a fantastic question, Molly, because there are some steps that um, we often recommend, um, sometimes we write these steps even into a behavior support plan as kind of an antecedent strategy, um, but these are evidence-based steps that we um, have seen, you know, are tried and true for building positive working relationships. And I want to make it clear when I say a positive working relationship, I'm not just talking about the work environment. Um, I'm talking about relationships in general. So those could be relationships in the home setting. Um, they could be relationships from colleague to colleague or even supervisor to supervisee. Um, it really doesn't matter. These steps can work for improving any relationship. Um, and the thing is, I think when people feel as though they have a really positive relationship with somebody, it's almost like we think, good, we get along with that person. Um, it's, we're solid, right? And we think that that can't drift or fade over time. But if we don't take care of our relationships and maintain them, those relationships can break down over time, especially if we take for granted um, maybe the give and take of that relationship or the effort that, that the other people might be putting in. Um, so when we see that relationships are suffering, oftentimes that, that might look like um, a child not wanting to follow your direction or even spend time with you. Um, in the school setting, it could be that students don't turn in your direction when you're speaking or giving instruction. Um, it could be staff members showing up late to a staff meeting and not wanting to participate or not coming prepared. So when relationships break down, you start to see um, less involvement and less, um, you know, follow through with some of our expectations and the things that normally we might see if the relationship was really strong. Um, so some of the things that those seven steps really talk about, uh, um, and these don't have to be done in order. Um, they're not really meant to be presented in a stepwise fashion. You can really be doing all of them at once. And really that's the recommendation. Um, but the, the, the first step that we talk about is often in relation to um, helping the people that you wanna improve the relationship with, helping them to access the items that they need or want to have to make their day more successful. Um, so for example, if you are in a classroom and all of the materials or the toys or the items that students need or want to engage with are just readily available and they're accessible for free, you're missing an opportunity to pair yourself with reinforcement or to be the giver of the good stuff, right? 
Um, so if you have control over some of those things and you can give them to the students and say, sure, you can use a special glitter glue or absolutely you can have you know, the Lego box. Um, being able to give the good stuff is a really nice way to show the person you're building a relationship with that you, you want them to have the things that will make them happy. Um, um, so sometimes we tell people to, to kind of take control over some of those items so that you can give them over um, while you're working on that relationship building. Um, another step is all about, we call it pairing. And that's really just putting, your, putting yourself with the good stuff like I was just talking about. Um, so making sure that you're, you're fun, that every interaction that you have um, is, is adding the extra good stuff again, the extra fun to the interaction. So if you are a teacher and you're coming in to read a story to a class, the story is extra good when you're there because you do the voices or you put on the funny hats and wigs when you do the characters. Um, likewise, you know, if you are at a staff meeting, you know, it doesn't have to be dry and boring. It could be that you bring some element of fun to your staff because it's okay to be fun and to have um, lighthearted inter interactions with people. And I think we all, especially in these times, are looking for that. Um, next, we have just, next, we have just developing trust. So this really boils, boils down to saying what you mean and meaning what you say. So when we talk out loud and we tell people we're going to do certain things, but then we fall away from our um, commitments, it tends to break trust with people. So we really encourage people to try very hard to follow through with um, the things that they say they'll do so that they can be trusted in that relationship. Um, next, we talk about um, actually direction following. following. So whether you're in the home, the school, or the work environment, there's always going to be some sort of expectation that's given, right? Some sort of a direction. And when those directions feel hard um, or less preferred, and we don't have a history of being reinforced for following directions with you, you're probably not going to follow the ones that feel really hard. So what we tell people is to give more directions more often, but really easy directions. So if you're having a hard time getting your child to clean their room, giving them the direction of go clean up your whole room that maybe right now is a big mess. If you give them smaller, easier to follow directions, such as could you just put your socks in your sock drawer and then could you come downstairs and hey, do you mind turning off the light on your way down the stairs? Giving really easy directions and then reinforcing along the way kind of builds that momentum so that your child or your learner will be reinforced by following directions and want to follow directions with you again in the future. So that really helps with that positive relationship as well. Um, I've been kind of talking about it through this whole thread, but another step is just making sure you're using reinforcement through the whole, um, all of these steps and through your interactions. So anytime that someone is interacting with you in a, a good positive way or is following your directions or doing things that are helpful, you wanna make sure to call that behavior out. Um, and not just saying, hey, thanks for doing it, or great job, but using behavior-specific praise, okay? So telling them, I really appreciate that you turned off the light when I asked you to, okay? Um, the last couple, uh, one is all about knowing, about knowing your priorities and knowing the priorities of the person that you're working with. Um, so if you have somebody who's trying really hard to get through a particular project, um, and that really could be a colleague or a student, right? Um, and they really need some help or support uh, distracting them or asking them to do other tasks is, is not going to support that relationship. Letting them know that you understand their priority in that moment um, and helping them to achieve that priority is a great way to build relationships. Um, and then the last one is really just about being consistent. Um, um, so with consistency, what we're talking about is ensuring that when we do have expectations of somebody, that we look for them to follow through before we let them access any reinforcement or um, making sure that we don't modify our expectations following some challenging behavior. Um, so again, that really comes down to being trusted um, and building a positive relationship. But if somebody knows that you're gonna be inconsistent, um, it kind of breaks down trust and makes it harder for that person to wanna spend time with you. So um, consistency in your actions and your words is very important. Uh, so th that's a, a quick and dirty, dirty, but those are the seven steps that have a lot of evidence behind them for um, really building positive relationships. So um, thank you, Molly, for asking that question.
Yeah, thank, thank you both. I think when I hear ABA, it sounds a little daunting, but when I listen to both of you talk, I'm hearing really usable strategies that I already kind of implement in my day to day without knowing it. The breaking down for smaller, easier directions. I do that all the time on my to do list, right? Like, <laughs> instead yeah. of clean the whole house, I'm putting down, you know, get the dishes done. And, and that's exactly the strategies that we, we can kind of leverage with our students and our youth in our lives. Um, also, it's okay to be fun might be my new motto. That's. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. So I just, I'm so excited. And Brandy, it looks like you had something else to add. Oh, no, just like the catch someone doing good. Yeah. We're so, you know, we are so quick to only, you know, do the negative and it's not, that's not how you're going to build positive interactions and positive relationships. And like you said, have fun. <laughs> if you're not enjoying your interactions and providing that, you know, genuine enthusiasm, it's not going to be there. Yeah, absolutely. What a positive note to leave it off on. Just have fun. <laughs> Enjoy what you're doing. Um, so I want to thank you both for taking time today to join me and answer some of my questions. I want to encourage um, anyone listening to leave questions in the comments. We're going to check back pretty regularly and hoping to do a Q&A at the end of the series with all the questions that you post to us. Um, and if you ever want to reach out to us, again, social media is kind of everywhere for the New Hampshire Department of Ed for Constellations. And we hope you have a great day. Mm -hmm.